this was when I read this uh, case, which was um, handed down in September 2022. I found it uh, uh, rather disconcerting, to be fairly honest, and uh, an, uh, this attempt to void the contract for uh, through the doctrine of um, or doctrine. I don't know exactly how you say that, but doctrine of common mistake. Um, so I know John Lobb because I'm I'm French, so I I go to Paris quite often, and I also live in uh, London in England, so I know that. For uh, Parisian men and also for English men, John Lobb is a superb brand of uh, of uh, uh, beautiful footwear, and I, I really love John Lobb. I think they do a great job. So I was, of course, very interest, interested and intrigued by that case, and I had always wondered uh, how how basically they structure their affairs, John Lobb, and uh, between uh, France and uh, Paris and, and London. I always I always have wondered. Well, this actually case gave me a good understanding of how they work or don't work, not, not don't really work. So um, um, I I did an exhaustive review and analysis of England and Wales High Court Chancery Division decision, uh, dated the eighth of September two thousand twenty two on whether the agreement bounding the French business, which is John Lobb SAS, to the British business, which is Job Lob, Job, uh, John Lobb Limited, was void under the case law of common mistake. And um, uh, was it a good call for John Lobb Limited to pull such a claim? Uh, did John Lobb limited gain anything out of his public exposure and this washing of dirty laundry in the public eye through this uh through his court case i don't think so and um here is why i have reservations as to whether it was a good move now let's talk about the facts oh yeah much better so let's talk about the facts well so john lobb is as i said is a men's luxury footwear brand and it's worn by many celebrities in their time so such as cecil beaton orson wells and Catherine ebburn it was founded in sydney australia in 1849 by john lobb who was a brit from cornwall and uh, who had emigrated to Australia, and it was actually a, the son of a farm hand. So he really made himself and his whole family definitely go through the social, uh, 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 I mean, so the echelons, the upper echelons of the social ladder, because he was the son of a farm hand and he created this thriving business, you know, sing, single handedly uh, back in um, the 19th century, in originally in Australia. It's actually interesting to note that quite a lot of um, um, luxury fashion businesses were in this, in this area created out of Australia. For example, um, Elena Rubinstein, who was originally Polish, if I remember well, and they, they had to move out uh, of, of, of Poland, her and the family, but basically she immigrated to Australia. And this is where actually she also founded the cosmetics brand, Elena Rubinstein. There was another example which sprang to mind when I was writing this article, also in the fashion and luxury business, but um, I must admit, I, I have, um, I, I can't remember. Anyway, so John Lobb, same story than Elena Rubinstein. He created his business out of Sydney, Australia. However, in, 19, in 1866, the business moved to London in the United Kingdom and began trading from premises located at 296 Regent Street. In 14, 1946, apologies, in 1946, the business was incorporated by Eric Lobb, a descendant of founder John Lobb, and it was incorporated into Société John Lobb after the successful setup of a boutique located Rue du 29 Juillet in Paris around uh, 1900. So what happened is probably because the French were a bit more uptight on this, they um, decided to uh, 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 they decided to incorporate the uh, the French. Uh, the French branch into a subsidiary, John Lobb France. And in September 1972, Eric Lobb incorporated the shoemaking business into Job Lobb, John Lobb Limited, a private company limited by shares in London. 
the share capital of uh, uh, GAL, John Love Limited, was and still is £10,000 divided into 10,000 shares of £1 each. Eric Lobb and John Hunter Lobb, master bootmaker, seem to have been the two shareholders of GAL upon incorporation in 1972. The five original directors of GAL were mostly members of a family, except John White, bootmaker. So there was, of course, Eric Lobb, but also John Hunter Lobb, Alice Margaret Ellen Lobb, and Edward Eric Lobb. So really a family business. GSL shares um, yeah, are still now held by various members of the uh, Lobb family. You can check that on the, um, the incorporate um, the website of Companies House. In 1976, the majority of the shares in JLF, so John Lobb France, was sold by Eric Lobb to the French luxury goods business Hermès, French business Hermès. Hermès acquired control of John Lobb France, as well as the rights in a trademark registered in France by Eric Lobb, which protected JLF's products. So we're going to call it from now on the trademark. Meanwhile, John Lobb France was transformed into a Société par Action Simplifiée, or SAS, and continued developing and operating its own luxury footwear business under the steady hand of Hermès. And um, uh, the um, general manager of Hermès, Guillaume de Seine, is also currently the CEO of John Lobb SAS. So, and, and you can really see actually the synergies between John Lobb and Hermès because they both do provide lots of leather products, very high quality leather products. So it does make com complete sense for, you know, the top management of Hermès to also be involved in, in, in the John Lobb France as business. From 1976 onwards, there has been collaboration between the businesses of John Lobb Limited and John Lobb SAS. Indeed, uh, John Lobb SAS operated uh, and continued to operate its business selling footwear under uh, the John Lobb name. Hermès started registering international trademarks around the world, which were ex international extensions of the trademark, the trademark I mentioned before, in order to protect the John Lobb brand. So together, all these international extensions of the trademark are called the trademark portfolio. From now on, we're going to call them the trademark portfolio. So in order to regularize this collaboration, as well as clarify the rights of John Lobb Limited and John Lobb SAS into the trademark and the trademark portfolio, GL and GLSAS, together with Eric Lobb, entered into a written agreement on the 9th of March 1992, called the Radlet Agreement. Already, signs of poor legal drafting services rendered were identified into the Radlet Agreement since clause 10 of a rad debt agreement set out that it was entered into for a period of 15 years, at which time its operation shall be reviewed by GLL and GLSAS. And such clause 10 did not specify a start date for this uh, 15 years period. However, clause 9 of a rad debt agreement, which related to financial matters, set out that the agreement was, the rad debt agreement, was entered into from 9th of March 1992. So that means that around 2017, then the Radlet uh, agreement would um, come to a halt. Let me double check that. We said 15 years and it started in 1992 plus, that's right, 2007, apologies. In 2007, it was due for renewal of the Radlet agreement. The recitals to the Radlet agreement set out that the property rights in the trademark were Seeded, I quote here, seeded by Eric Lobb to J, uh, John Lobb SAS, pursuant to an agreement between the parties dated 24th of May 1976, so the prior agreement, in consideration of a payment of a percentage of John Lobb SAS turnover for the years between 31st of March 1976 and 31st of December 1985. A trademark was registered in other countries hence creating the trademark portfolio, and recorded the co costs incurred by John Lobb SAS in this respect. And the last recitals was that the parties wished to continue to collaborate and, I quote here, extend existing agreements to the manufacture, promotion, and sales of products described in classes and categories of a trademark 
already registered throughout the world. So through various clauses, the Radlet Agreement gave John Lodd SAS the right to the manufacture, promotion, and sales of ready-to-wear footwear and of a trademark throughout the world. But such right was limited under Clause 2 uh, since Job Knob SAS agreed not to manufacture made to measure handmade footwear in the UK and of a trademark and assign it to John Lobb Limited any rights which may have accrued to John Lobb SAS in the UK by its acquisition of a trademark in made to measure handmade and handmade footwear. So that means that John Lobb SAS had rights on the trademark throughout the world, but it not in the UK because in the UK, only John Lobb Limited could um, uh, use such trademark. And so in exchange for this um, uh, 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 permanent assignment of a trademark, the Radlet Agreement provided that John Lobb SOS agreed to make annual payments to John Lobb Limited, which were expressed to be in consideration for extending the prior agreement in accordance with the terms and conditions of a Radlet Agreement. Again, this is, you know, poorly drafted, not very clear. Um, and um, so there were some supplementary provisions also in clause six to nine. And um, these provisions were for payment to uh, John Lodd Limited. And they were actually amended when um, Hermes acquired Edward Green and Company Limited, another luxury UK footwear manufacturer. The sums payable to John Lobb Limited were increased to take into account the increase in turnover resulting from this acquisition. So, Clause 11 of the Radlett Agreement provided that it was governed by and construed in accordance with the laws of England and Wales. And you know, that was fine for Hermes because Hermes is a national, uh, sorry, is an international business. The English English laws are uh, trustworthy, efficient. The English court system is also efficient. So I'm sure Hermes and John Lobesos were fine with absolutely fine with that. And since the termination of a Radlett agreement was planned to take place in March 2007, as I mentioned before, 2007 was the cutoff date. Negotiations between the parties kicked off in late 2005 concerning the nature and terms of a relationship between the parties, which was to follow the Radlett agreement. So on March 2006, um, John Lobb SAS solicitors, DLA Piper, sent a letter to Hermes which contained advice, uh, quote here, in relation to your rights or ownership and use of a trademark. So in this letter, which was in which basically, which was copied to GLL as uh, John Lobb Limited as part of the negotiations, it was set out, as I said, at the outset, well, there have over the years been a number of agreements and discussions between the parties. Hermes ownership of a trademark is well documented. John Lobb Limited has recently proper has received proper consideration for the acquisition by Hermes of those exclusive rights, and Hermes is entitled to continue to use, exploit, and protect those rights as any trademark owner would be. Okay, so for the letter, you know. DLA was just saying Hermes owns the right to the trademark and um, and we're going to continue exploiting those rights. And now let's talk about the agreement. <laughs> so on the 6th of March 2008, John Lobb SS and John Lobb Limited, as well as the shareholders of John Lobb Limited, entered into an agreement organizing the future relationship, which was entitled and I quote here, agreement relating to John Lobb name and trademark. So that from now on, we're going to call it the 2008 agreement. So this 2008 agreement provided that the prior agreement dealt with the sale of a trademark. The trademark was registered for its protection in various countries by John Lobb SAS. John Lobb Limited and John Lobb SAS had fully cooperated to maintain and develop a mutual business built on the trademark and trade name LOB with a view to ensure that standards continue in the future. And John Lobb SS is the legal and beneficial owner and registered proprietor of a trademark throughout the world and has all the rights in the trademark safe in respect of the rights enjoyed by John Lobb Limited set out in clause one. 
of the 2008 agreement. And uh, this is in relation to the uh, rights that John Lump Limited has in the UK over the trademark. So, um, pursuant to clause two of the 2008 agreement, John Lub SOS would make annual financial payments to John Lub Limited over two consecutive periods of five years and a first annual payment uh, for the period from March 2007 to March 2008 and the final annual payment of £35,000 fell due for payment on or before the 10th of March 2017. Um, so... Yeah, so uh, there were five annexes to the 2008 agreement, in particular Annex B, which set out a list of the trademarks registered in various countries, which corresponds to the um, trademark portfolio I mentioned before. So from 2008 to 2017, the parties operating under the terms of the 2008 agreement without issue. However, on the 19th of April 2017, so shortly before the... Um, the payment of £35,000 was actually it was due on the 10th of March 2017. But uh, so on or around the time payment of £35,000 had to be paid, G G John Lobb Limited Solicitors Clintons sent a formal letter of claim to DLA, John Lobb SAS Council. And in this letter of claim, it set out the grounds of challenge to the validity of a 2008 agreement and asserted that it was void on the basis of common mistake. What? They, common mistake? So the procedure uh, that ensued is as follow. Since, I quote here, some reasonable endeavors to resolve problems through discussion at senior management level apparently failed, John Lobb Limited started litigation proceedings by claim form issued on the 22nd of May 2020. John Lobb Limited's case is that the 2008 agreement was void from the outset on the basis of common mistake, and John Lobb Limited is the beneficial owner of a trademark portfolio, with the exception of a trademark. So GLL uh, particulars of claim were amended via some amended particulars of claim actually, just, you know, for the record, I'm just mentioning this. So um, in these amended particulars of claim, paragraph 26 set out that the 2008 agreement was entered into by both John Lord Limited and John Lord SAS on the basis of a fundamentally mistaken and commonly held belief as to the ownership rights in the trademark portfolio. And so the alleged common mistake, which is relied upon by John Lord Limited is I quote here, a fundamentally uh, mistaken and commonly held belief as to the ownership right in the trademark portfolio. So to beef up its claims, John Lodd Limited set out in the amended particulars of claim that the letter contained the following material. So when I mentioned the letter, I mentioned the DLA's letter uh, from, uh, from around 2007, contained the following mat material sessions of fact. Um, in 1975, Harry Lobb began negotiating with Hermes for the sale to Hermes of a majority of the shares in John Lobb SAS. Part of that agreement was to be the acquisition by Hermes of the rights to the trademark throughout the world. In March 1976, the agreement for the purchase of the shares was signed and Eric Lobb confirmed that before he received any payment for the shares, he would transfer the trademark rights to Hermes John Lobb SAS. Consideration for the transfer of the trademark rights was installment payments calculated as a percentage of turnover payable over a number of years from 1976 to 1985. And between 1976 to 1992, John Lobb SAS, exercising its acquired trademark rights, applied for registered protection for the trademarks around the world. In 1992, Eric Lobb, John Lobb, John Lobb Limited and John Lobb SS entered into a further agreement, the Radlet Agreement, with the aim of confirming John Lobb Limited's rights to use the trademark only for the manufacturing and commercialization of made to measure handmade footwear and confirming John Lobb SS exclusive rights for every, to everything else. So then John Lobb um, Limited alleged in the amended particulars of claim that the letter contained fundamental errors of facts of his DLA letter 
contain the fundamental errors of fact as follows. So the letter, the DLA letter asserted that in 1975, 1976, Eric Lobb agreed to transfer to Hermes and did so transfer the right to protect and exploit the trademark throughout the world, i.e. Uh, to assign to Hermes and to John Lobb SS, the entire worldwide goodwill and reputation in the John Lobb name built up by the predecessors in um, title to John Lobb Limited over a period exceeding 125 years. And according to John Lobb Limited in its amended particulars of claim, this assertion was manifestly false, having regard in particular to the terms of a prior agreement pursuant to which all that Eric Lobb was agreeing to transfer in terms of trademark rights was the trademark which John Lobb SAS required in order to conduct the French-based business which it was in substance acquiring. So accordingly, for G John Lobb Limited, it was also incorrect that the consideration payable under the prior agreement was for the trademark rights as asserted and described in the letter. It was also incorrect that John Lobb SOS applied for registered protection for the trademark exercising its acquired trademark rights. Accordingly, any agreement subsequently made between the parties to the Radlett Agreement, which reflected this wholly inaccurate series of factual assertions and which assumed GLSS, John Lobb SOS uh, ownership of a trademark portfolio, would not be one which uh, accorded with the intention of the parties, but would be one which assumed a fundamentally different and false set of factual and legal premises, in particular to the ownership of a John Love Marx outside France. And also the, partic the amended particulars of claim of John Love Limited uh, asserted that the 2008 agreement was such an agreement. So to summarize, in a nutshell, John Love is saying it is actually a mistake, a common mistake that John Love um, Limited made back you know, when he did that prior agreement in uh, the 70s. And the only thing that John Lobb Limited agreed to was the transfer of a French trademark to John Lobb SS and to MS. But all the trademark portfolio uh, 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 belongs to John Lobb Limited, the UK entity. So that's in a nutshell is what John Lobb Limited is saying. Um, exactly. John Lobb case is that it only agreed to enter into the agreement because it believed to be true and accurate the assertions made in the DLA letter and the assertions made in the course of discussions by representative of John Lobb SAS as to the ownership of a trademark portfolio during the negotiations. And uh, therefore, according to John Lobb Limited, John Lobb Limited and John Lobb SAS entered into the 2008 agreement on the basis of a fundamentally mistaken and commonly held belief that John Lobb SS owned the trademark portfolio on the basis of all the reasons set out in the DLA letter and during the negotiations. So the true position John Lobb Limited contended in its amended statement of claims was that the beneficial ownership of the in the trademark was in fact vested in John Lobb Limited with a sole exception of a trademark. And in its amended particulars of claim, John Lodd Limited uh, proceeding on to asking for principal relief, declaratory relief, comprising a declaration that John Lodd Limited is not bound by the terms of a 2008 agreement on the basis that it is void from the outset for common mistake, and a declaration that John Lodd Limited is beneficially entitled to the ownership of a trademark portfolio, including the register protections with the, the exception of a trademark. So, Aghast, I suppose, John Lobb SOS and Hermès filed a defense in the action and made an application by application notice dating 4th August 2022, denying John Lobb Limited's right to any of the relief claimed as follows. John Lobb SOS sought as relief an order striking out the amended particulars of claim pursuant to 3.42a of the civil procedural uh, rules on the basis that the amended particulars of claim disclosed no reasonable ground for bringing the claim. Okay, so this 3.42 of the CPR of the civil procedural cl clause is basically we want to strike out this case because uh, there aren't any reasonable grounds for bringing or uh, defending the claim. So that was the first, uh, the first 
a, 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 a branch of the defense of uh, John Lobb SAS. And then secondly, John Lobb SAS sought as relief summary judgment against John Lobb Limited on the whole of a claim pursuant to tw Article 242AI of the CPR of the Civil Procedural Rules on the basis that John Lobb Limited had no real prospect of success on the claim and that there was no other compelling reason why the case should be disposed of at trial. So this clause 24.2 um, is the ground for summary judgment when there are no real prospect of success on the claim or issue. So basically the um, defendant is asking to strike the, the, the claim off because it's not reasonable. So, and consequential on this relief, John Lobb SOS uh, asked in his defense, an order for dismissal of a claim and cost was also sought by them. In a judgment dated 24th of May, 2021, the High Court Judge, Deputy Master Marsh, concluded that John Lobb Limited had real prospect of showing that the claim for a declaration of a 2008 agreement was void on the basis of common mistake based on the four required elements of a claim based upon common mistake defined um, by the judgment of a court of appeal, which was delivered by Lord Philip in Great Peace Shipping Limited versus Savlis Salvage. It's called the Great Peace, Peace Case. Great Peace as in peace as in P-E-A-C-E. -E. So the Great Peace Case, okay? So, interestingly enough, the judge and the first degree judge, the high court judge, actually found that GLL John Lobb Limited had a real prospect of, uh, of showing that the um, 2008 agreement was void on the basis of common mistake under application of the Great Peace uh, case law. John Lobb SS was unable to show that John Lobb Limited's case on limitation was bound to fail because John Lobb Limited could not establish the second element or the fourth element identified in great peace. So that another finding that is another finding that um, Deputy Master Marsh uh, uh, made and set out in his judgment from May 2021. So he continued by saying that the first element identified in great peace for this common law, uh, common mistake doctrine. It, so this is the requirement that the parties have entered into a contract under the common assumption as to the existence of a state of affairs. So this is the first element. It was met. That ele first element was met. And then the second element identified in Greenpeace, which is that there must be no warranty by either party that that state of affair affairs exists. This is the second element. According to uh, the, high the High Court judge, that was met as well. Same for the third element identified in green peace, in great peace, sorry, which is the non-existence of a state of affairs uh, must render performance of a contract impossible. So according to um, Deputy Judge March, uh, that third element was also met. Same thing for the fourth element identified in great peace, which was the state of affairs, maybe the experience or a vital attribute of a consideration to be provided. So, the uh, High Court judge also found that John Lobb SS had not demonstrated that John Lobb Limited had no real prospect of success, and John Lobb SS application was dismissed, both in relation to the application for summary judgment and the application to strike out. So, of course, and thank, uh, thankfully, John Lobb SS appealed the first degree judgment on the following grounds. The judge went wrong in his approach to the doctrine of common mistake by failing to apply correctly the elements of the doctrine, specifically the second element and the fourth element, as set out by the Court of Appeal in Great Peace. Also in its appeal, John Lott SS mentioned that the judge was wrong to reason that the 2008 agreement could not be construed on an application for summary judgment or strike out, when it gave rise to a short point of flaw and construction, which was capable of being determined in the absence of any dispute for the purpose of John Lobb SS application about the relevant matrix of act and or on the basis of the facts alleged by G, uh, John Lobb uh, Limited. So, um, Anyway, that's a, 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 a wordy uh, way to say that uh, 
um, that basically the uh, this this re re request to actually uh, make the 2008 uh, agreement void uh, uh, could not be the, the base of an application for summary judgment or being stricken out. Then John Love SOS in its appeal also mentioned that the judge was wrong to regard the doctrine of common mistake as being insufficiently settled. And according to John Lobb SAS in its appeal, the judge misunderstood the fourth element as being concerned with something less than impossibility of performance of the contractual adventure and instead treated this element as asking whether performance is essentially different to that common assumption. If the judge had correctly applied the law of common mistake, he would have been bound to conclude that there was no reasonable grounds for John Lobb Limited to bring the claim for rescission of the 2008 agreement and should either have struck out the claim or should have concluded that John Lund Limited's claim had no realistic prospect of success and was suitable for summary disposal. So anyway, in a nutshell, John Lund SOS is saying in his appeal, are you mad? That's what he's saying. Are you mad? Of course, the second and fourth element of the doctrine of common mistake um, are not met in this matter, um, High Court judge. and. Uh, this is sufficient ground to actually uh, strike out this, this, this claim or just dispose of it. And, uh, the, you know, both provisions we mentioned before of a CPR. And um, in a seminal appeal judgment handed down on the 8th of September 2022, Justice Edwin Johnson found for John Lobb SS because the High Court judge decision in relation to the second element identified by Lord Phillips in Great Peace was inexact because a warranty on the state of affairs actually existed in the 2008 agreement. This is to say that the 2008 agreement sets out that John Lord SOS is the legal and beneficial owner and registered proprietor of a trademark portfolio throughout the world and has therefore the rights in the trademark portfolio, save for the rights enjoyed by John Lord Limited. Uh, set out in clause one of a 2008 agreement and relating to the English, the, 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 the UK territory. Also, the um, appeal judge found that the 2008 agreement allocated the risk in the event that the assumption was wrong to John Lobb Limited by the combined operation of recital G and clause 1.3 of the 2008 agreement. I mean, between you and I, this um, um, judgment, this appeal judgment from the 8th of September 2022 is quite a mouthful to read, okay, so that's why I called it a seminal appeal judgment, it's quite a mouthful to read and it goes on and on about, you know, super complex ways to assess whether um, the second element, the fourth element of the great peace case law relating to the doctrine of common mistake are met or not. And I will definitely not delve into this because nobody cares. But the outcome uh, is that the appeal judge found that both the second and the fourth element were not met. Um, and it was inexact uh, to say that it, they were because the alleged non-existence of a state of affairs did not either render the performance of a 2008 agreement impossible or render the sub subject matter of a 2008 agreement essentially and radically different from the subject matter which the parties believed to exist. And then the high uh, the appeal judge also found that the claim that the 2008 agreement was void from the outset on the basis of common mistake could not succeed. John Lott Limited had no real uh, or indeed any prospect of succeeding in its claim to avoid the 2008 agreement on the basis of common mistake. The appeal uh, judge also found that John Lott SAS is entitled to summary judgment against John Lott Limited and there is no reason for John Lott Limited's action to go to trial. Although this conclusion was strictly academic, the Appeal judge found that on the summary judgment application, the first degree judge was actually right to decline the strike out, strike out John Lott limited claims pursuant to uh, CPR 3.42A. Um, so anyway, consequently, the uh, outcome of the appeal was that the appeal was allowed on the basis that judge was wrong, the uh, High Court judge was wrong to dismiss John Lobb SLS application to so far as John Lobb SS sought summary judgment against John Lobb Limited, 
and the appeal judge made an order for summary judgment against John Love Limited on the whole of its claims in the action, and the appeal judge made an order for the dismissal of John Love Limited's claims in the action. Um, let, now let's analyze this this case and um, and the um, the appeal decision and also the first degree decision and judgment. I mean, I think that what can definitely be said about these is that um, and and also the attitude of the parties is that there is a total lack of self awareness here um, from uh, John Lobb Limited and its management and also from its counsel, uh, Clintons. What on earth were they thinking? Bringing this, you know, common mistake doctrine from, you know, out of the woods, all of a sudden, while this, uh, these, these various agreements had been in place since, you know, the, uh, um, the 20s, you know, the 20s between John Lobb France and John Lobb UK. So I was just out of the, out of order really. So before launching themselves into fully fledged litigation, uh, John Lobb Limited should have assessed in an impartial, thorough and rigorous manner whether they had enough ammunitions to put into the common mistake gun instead of blindly following the intuition, let's call it intuition, of family member, qualified solicitor and new John Lobb Limited's in-house lawyer, Nicholas Lobb, who joined the family business in 2013 and put this whole craziness into motion. I mean, the crux of the issue here is that John Lobb Limited wants out of the 2008 agreement, which is permanent, perpetual, and cannot be terminated, except in case of major change of share ownership in either John Lobb Limited or John Lobb SS. So for uh, just to clarify this, if um, the 10,000 shares from John Lobb Limited were to be sold to any external party from the John Lobb family, um, then Hermès would have a preemption right to buy those shares, and also this would trigger the termination of the 2008 agreement. And I think there's also a reciprocal clause uh, uh, for John Lobb SS to the effect that if the um, um, shareholding of John Lobb SS was to get out of the hands of Hermès, then that would trigger the termination of the 2008 agreement. So, so the issue here at stake is that the John Lobb family is, is stuck in this 2008 agreement and they can't get out of it, except if, if they sort of sell out, which I suppose they don't really want to do. So probably like in the Chanel saga, so I refer you to uh, 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 my article and, um, and live webinar of last week in relation to how um, Chanel was uh, set up by Gabrielle Chanel and, um, and her two uh, co-owners, the Wartheimer brothers. And so, uh, so you can actually uh, uh, read this, uh, this um, uh, article on, uh, on Chanel on um, um, crefovy.com uh, slash publications in English and crefovy.fr slash publication in, in French. So like in the Chanel saga, John Lund Limited and the Lobb family want to get more money from, for the trademark po 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 portfolio uh, and renegotiate the terms of the 2008 agreement in this respect. And well, I mean, okay, this is understandable because a lot of uh, fashion and luxury businesses are coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic and the economic recession, um, you know, feeling pretty uh, raw and, um, and a lot of them have cash flow issues and um, even sometimes they actually have to close down and being wound up at the moment in France, there are lots of companies um, in the consumer goods and particular fashion businesses which have to be wound up such as Gospor, uh, and um, and lots of French brands as well, Pinky, et cetera, they all have to close down because they're dead. But using the common mistake doctrine in this case was amateurish and naive at best uh, on the part of uh, John Lodd Limited and its uh, council, uh, Clintons. The parties and signatories to the 2008 agreement, among them many members of the Lobb family, were all professionals and capable adults. They cannot seriously claim that they misunderstood misunderstood the explicit and clear terms of the 2008 agreement 
um, or for that matter, the uh, terms of a two of a DLA letter, especially in respect of a subject of which party owns which trademark. I mean, this is a stark warning to commercial practitioners like DLA and uh, Clintons of the results of uh, that ambiguity in legal drafting can cause, but also the significance where allocation of risk is found within a contract and the consequences this can have on the findings of common mistake as to as the case is here. I think it would have been way more astute for John Lobb Limited Management and legal team to enter into confidential and good faith negotiations with Hermes and John Lobb's SAS in order to renegotiate the amount of the first final annual payment of £35,000 due by 2017 by amending clause two of the 2008 agreement and also potentially some other clauses in the 2008 agreement that they uh, had come to hate and disagree with. Um, they could have asked for additional annual payments to be made every five or 10 years of execution of a 2008 agreement since its term is without any limit in time, i.e. this 2008 agreement is perpetual except as I said in the case of external shareholding are happening in uh, in both parties, I, in sorry, either one of the parties. So this litigation case, which splashes uh, splashes out in front of a UK High Court and then the UK Appeal Court, confidential terms set up both in the Radlett Agreement and the 2008 Agreement, drawing public attention to the business of John Lobb for all the wrong reasons, is a public relations disaster for John Lobb Limited and by ricochet for John Lobb SOS. If good faith negotiations with Hermes and John Lobb's SS to renegotiate the payments owed to John Lobb Limited on the grounds of the trademark portfolio fail, then John Lobb Limited should bring a claim uh, in court to request a renegotiation or termination of a 2008 agreement, which term is perpetual and without limit. In particular, they could claim that there has been an, an unforeseeable change in circumstances and all force majeure, and uh, knowing that such uh, reasons are valid reasons to negotiate a long-term contract in jurisdictions such as China, France, Germany, and Japan. So even though it's not in the UK a um, valid reason to negotiate a long-term contract, uh, uh, this, this uh, unforese unforeseeable change in circumstances or force majeure, it was, however, it could have been worth trying um, in front of the UK courts. And, but anything other than this common mistake, doctrine, stupidity, frankly, I mean, fr they really looked amateurish, John Lobb Limited and Clinton's. So if a uh, court claim fails, then it may be uh, time for the John Lobb family to sell out by triggering clause five of the 2008 agreement and renegotiate and negotiate the highest payment they can get for all the, the 10,000 shares in John Lobb Limited from Hermes which has a preemption right, uh, or any other interested bidder. And I'm pretty sure if a John Love family wanted to get out of a business in the UK, Amos would buy them no problem whatsoever, and probably at any price they would want. So that's my analysis um, on the uh, this intriguing John Lobb uh, litigation case. And I thank you so much for joining me today on this matter. And um, I'll uh, speak to you next week. Bye everyone, bye-bye.